From Washington, the McLaughlin Group, the American Original. For over two decades, the sharpest minds, best sources, hardest talk. If, for such a small word, it packs a wallop. If I live to a hundred, if Social Security isn't enough, if my heart gets broken, if she says yes. We believe if should never hold you back. If should be managed with a plan that builds on what you already have. Together, we can create a personal safety net, a launching pad for all those brilliant ifs in the middle of life. You can call on our expertise and get guarantees for the if in life. After all, we're MetLife. It's the 28th Annual McLaughlin Group Year-End Awards, 2009, Part 2. Here's the Master of Ceremonies, John McLaughlin. Destined for political stardom, 2010. Marco Rubio, future United States Senate, Republican hero in the future. Hello. We've got a Republican woman, uh, Meg Whitman, who's contending to be governor of California, former CEO of eBay. And a Democratic woman, uh, Maria Cantwell, senator from Washington State, who's about to take the lead on climate change legislation in the U.S. Senate. Monica. I have three rising stars on the right. Uh, number one, Carly Fiorina, who's running in California against Barbara Boxer for the U.S. She Senate. She's going to win? I think she will win. Uh -huh. Yes, in so. this climate, I think she, she has a very good shot. Also, the Virginia governor, the new uh, Republican there, Bob McDonnell, and a surprise, Jenny Sanford, who is the soon-to-be ex-wife of the South Carolina governor, Mark Sanford. They're getting a divorce. She has political aspirations of her own, and I think she could be dynamite. Don't run for governor? Run for governor. Uh, what? Well, I think the political stars of uh, 2010 are going to be the Republican congressional leaders who are going to have the success of a huge victory in November of next year. Uh, the envelope, please, Monica. Uh, you cleaned up pretty well there, McLaughlin. Thank you, thank you very much. You're uh, that's a further credit to me, and uh, put that on the list of credits. <laughs> now, on this envelope, uh, this is the way I remove the uh, thingy, and here we are. We'll read this to you as soon as I uh, take care of it. <laughs> Pat, does that remind you of anything, Pat? That's it. What's that remind you of? Karnak the Magnificent. <laughs> Where was he? Who was he? Johnny Carson. Right. Destined for political stardom in 2010. John Huntsman, Obama's ambassador to China, the Republican former governor of Utah, Huntsman, will be drafted by the GOP at the 2012 convention to run against, presumably, President Obama. Okay, destined for political oblivion, Pat. Arnold, the Terminator is terminated in 2010. Naturally, by the extension of his And he term. ain't going anywhere else. He doesn't <laughs> want to go anywhere. <laughs> Eleanor. Uh, Mike Huckabee, whose presidential ambitions have been short-circuited by his pardon of a felon who then shot and killed four police officers in Seattle. Monica. Uh, Democratic control of the House of Representatives. And uh, as part of that, the runner-up, Harry Reid, who is going to go the way of his predecessor, Tom Daschle. <laughs> Out of there. <laughs> what? Well, I was just about to say, Senator Harry Reid, the majority leader in the Senate, is going to lose in his uh, re-election bid in the next year in November. Well, let's move it to the White House, destined for political oblivion. Rahm Emanuel, he's the White House Chief of Staff. <laughs> And he will be forced to fall on his sword after Democrats in Congress suffer staggering losses, as you pointed out, in the 2010 midterm elections. Okay, best political theater, Pat. The Beer Summit with Sergeant Crowley and Joe Biden and Professor Gates and Obama. On TV, John. Great theater. Yeah. And well, uh, Gates looks good Crowley and Biden, Biden looks good. Oh, I think Biden, I agree with Monica from last week, Biden looks very, very good. He had a rough first half. He's doing fine Hello. in the second half. Uh, well, the year started in January, so I'm going with Blago, who uh, Governor Blagojevich was uh, impeached in January and then went on to a whole saga of reality shows. And it's uh, great political theater, too, because you got the feeling he was somehow enjoying it all along the way. Monica. The town hall demonstrations this summer against the government takeover of health care, those demonstrations are exactly what the founding fathers had in mind. When their representatives got out of control, the people rose up. Mark. Uh, Sarah Palin's book tour, which she organized in small towns where she had a lot of support, catapulted her not only to the number one uh, uh, on the uh, Amazon list, but to the leading a Republican candidate for the presidency. Oh, Sarah, Sarah, powerhouse. Best political theater, South Carolina's Republican governor. 
Mark Sanford was reported missing over the summer. His staff said he was backpacking in Appalachia. In reality, he was having an adulterous tryst with a lady in Buenos Aires. Okay, where's political theater? Pat? Another South Carolinian, South Carolinian Congressman Joe Wilson yelling, you lie at the President of the United States during a joint session of Congress. Is, Bad theater. Is that Carolingian rather Carolinian. than Carolinian? Carolinian. Isn't it really Carolingian? Carolingian is the French kings, John. Okay. Uh, um, <laughs> no French kings there. The worst political theater, the August town hall meetings masquerading as uh, representative America, of, of, of the real America when they were absolutely taken over by a minority of a minority, yelling and shouting obscenities. Well, they were also, as uh, Tomaskis wrote in the New York Review of Books, that they were racist. Oh, uh, come on. Racist. That's expressions absurd. uttered at uh, these no, 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 Monica? No, no. That was best political theater. Where are we? Worst political theater? Worst yeah, political we're... theater. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I lost my train of thought. You got uh, back this now? was yes, yes. That? This was when the White House passed out those white lab coats to the doctors oh. to, to use them as props to suggest that all doctors support Obamacare when, in right. fact, eighty percent oppose it. Yeah, and then the, the whole story was exposed. The White House right. was passing out the white coats to the doctors, put on the white coats. You know, Mort? Governor Patterson sending Caroline Kennedy out to pursue the Senate nomination to replace Hillary Clinton, only to have him withdraw. This is what you call political hokey pokey. <laughs> He puts his left foot in his mouth, then he puts his right foot in his mouth, and then he turns himself around. <laughs> Worst political theater, Senator Harry Reid, saying that opponents of his health care proposal were like slaveholders of the Civil War era. Okay, worst political scandal. I think it's that crowd of so-called scientists, hucksters, and hoaxers over there in East Anglia, England, who really put out all this false nonsense about global warming and censored honest scientists bringing the truth, Eleanor. <laughs> right on, Pat. A uh, very small percentage of emails that are being investigated does not change the science. The worst political scandal, there are so many to choose from. I'm going with Nevada Senator John Ensign, whose parents paid off the husband of his mistress, and then the senator intervened to try to get the husband a job. It's under investigation in the Ethics well, Committee. Well, it's not illegal, is it? Oh, I think there's a little crossing of the lines of what are pro supposedly appropriate ethics in the U.S. Well. Congress. It's okay why you? You well, only you wish you had parents. No, you've got to get with the times. You've got to get with the times, Eleanor. Okay. Monica. I am with Pat on Climate Gate. I think that is bar none the worst political scandal, but I'll give you another one. It is a national deficit at $1.4 trillion and a national debt ceiling being raised to $14 trillion. Oh. Scandalous. Oh, we've got to speed it up. More. Yeah, the financial disclosures and tax avoidance of the chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee, Charlie Rangel. Mm -hmm. uh, I like Charlie. No, I like him, too. I like him a lot. Worst political scandal, Attorney General Eric Holder's reopening of criminal probes into CIA counterterrorist officials and whether the, the CIA interrogations amounted to torture. Very bad. Okay. Most underreported story of 2009. There's no doubt the Arctic ice cap is shrinking, but Antarctica, many times as large, is growing and expanding. How come global warming is not dealing with that? Are you uh, buying real estate up there, Pat? <laughs> Adopting a few penguins, perhaps? Oh, cool. go ahead. Uh, und underreported, the full extent of the ties between the pharmaceutical and the insurance industry with members of Congress who have blocked health care reform. Yeah, blame the <laughs> blame capitalism. Most underreported the Tea Party movement was it which is a true widespread grassroots tax revolt. Any uh, numbers? We're gonna see more of this. Uh, more the discovery of water on the moon, which was caused or discovered through an explosion that we sent in a rocket that went through the surface of the moon and discovered it's a huge uh, astronomical discovery. And the interesting thing that it prompted Joe Biden to say, you know, we should have tried sanctions yeah. first. Are we going to see a Zuckerman <laughs> building now on the moon? We're working on it. Uh, most underreported story of 2009, the impact of the economic crisis on young Americans, including both college grads and college dropouts. Young Americans have the highest unemployment rates and two-thirds of them, 66%, voted for Obama. Their Obama allegiance has now vanished. Okay, the most overreported story of 2009. The death of Michael Jackson and the aftermath, enough already. Hello. Balloon Boy. I know Pat loved it, but <laughs> way overdone. Monica. All of the challenges facing the new president. It was as if President Obama was the first president to ever face a full plate and the first one to discover that the presidency is hard. Mark. 
The Octomom. Uh, on top of six children she had in vitro, she had another uh, octuplet, uh, which goes to prove you that, uh, that too much of a good thing is definitely not necessarily a good thing. The most overreported story of 2009, Tiger Woods, on the basis of journalistic ideals, that is, it was overreported, not on the basis of the public interest. The public wants to hear more and more and more. Okay, biggest government waste. Flying Barack Obama on Air Force One to Copenhagen to lobby for the Chicago Olympics. <laughs> have him rejected before he got down at Andrews Air Force Waste Base on the way home. Is that where he had his meeting with McChrystal, who came He's down had from a London? With McChrystal, right. right on the tarmac. Yeah, was that whole thing designed to get to pay my face told to him, face General, with McChrystal? General, get out of my face publicly, wasn't please. That the, wasn't that the first time he had a meeting with McChrystal? Was and it was engineered to cover the, the absence of meetings Se before that. Second face-to-face -face meeting, right? Hello. I don't know uh, what you guys are getting at, but I think the president has done his due dil diligence on what he should do in Afghanistan, and probably. What he came out with pleases both of you. Monica. Uh, wait, no, she hasn't done this. Her biggest government waste, the ballooning of private contractors, 74,000 of them in Afghanistan. Actually, more troop, more private contractors than troops this summer. Oh, are, you, are you going to admonish us or give out awards in the future? <laughs> I'd like to do both. <laughs> Monica. The biggest government waste, there's so much to choose from. $787 billion economic stimulus, a $1.1 trillion omnibus spending bill, a half a trillion dollar omnibus spending bill, a $100 billion auto bailout, a $3.5 trillion budget, and my favorite, it, the impending two trillion dollar health care entitlement. Uh, beautifully, beautifully stated. Pick More one. quickly. The billions of dollars of wasted contracts in Iraq and all the equipment they left behind in the literally the hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. You mean the whole war now? Well, no, it's it, but the spending that we have incurred in, in Iraq, just on, on infrastructure, which proved to be more or less irrelevant, it was just a huge was amount it, of waste. Uh, over a trillion. Yeah, it was over a trillion for sure. Was it a trillion and a half? Mm -hmm. Was well, close to two trillion dollars. Oh. You know. The biggest government waste, $3 billion for cash for clunkers. A one-time giveaway to car buyers and automakers. Half the money went overseas to foreign car makers. Mm -hmm. When clunkers ended, auto sales here dropped like a rock. Okay, best government dollar spent. The day the Supreme Court got paid for taking Frank Rick Ricky, doing justice to him and the New Haven firefighters, giving them the promotions that these guys earned. Hello. Sorry, John. Cash for clunkers. Successful federal program. Uh, touched a lot of middle American families. Oh, this is so, this is so, so much error. I don't know how to untangle it. Best, uh. best government dollar spent the salaries for Generals Petraeus, McChrystal, and Odierno. Best dollar spent. Yes. Underdollared. Underdollared. They underpaid. should receive more. Absolutely, yeah. More. The, be the uh, money that they spent for the beer for Skip Gates <laughs> and, and the policeman who arrested him in Cambridge because it prompted uh, Obama to do another book uh, that follows the audacity of hope. It's going to be called The Audacity of Hops. <laughs> <laughs> uh, first government dollar spent. The $8,000 tax credit for first-time home buyers. The credit drew buyers into the market and every home sold. Retailers also get new sales like furniture and refrigerators and appliances, so the tax credit has a multiplier effect. You know that, Pat, right? right? right. Okay, boldest political tactic. Sarah Palin intervenes in the 23rd District of New York and sinks the Republican candidate, Didi Skozafava, <laughs> and almost elects a conservative party third-party candidate. Um, Bold. <laughs> Bold. Talking about lem making lemonade, lemonade out of a lemon. <laughs> And the Republicans lose a seat, and somehow that's a victory. Yeah. <laughs> Boldest tactic, uh, Mayor Bloomberg changing the rules so he could win a third term. Two kids named Hannah Giles and James O'Keefe posing as a pimp and a prostitute went undercover and blew the lid off of the corruption in Acorn, leading the Congress to pull federal funding at least temporarily for you Acorn. you understand that whole story? Yes, I do, and it was the boldest political tactic of the year. What? The boldest political tactic was uh, President Obama bowing to Emperor Akihito and to the King of Saudi Arabia in failed attempts to enlist their support for his various policies. Not, not in, because they put, the effort failed. The effort failed, yes. <laughs> Otherwise, okay. <laughs> but it was a bold attempt. <laughs> bold, it succeeded. Boldest <laughs> political tactic. President Obama's cancellation of a missile shield in Poland and the Czech Republic. Russia now ha uh, is with the United States. It supports sanctions on Iran if Iran does not play ball. And Obama is praised as a statesman, mm -hmm. a great deal maker. This Obama. Okay, best idea of 2009. Sarah Hi. Palin calling her book "Going Rogue." Three hundred thousand first week. How Hello. many mentions of Sarah Palin <laughs> have you gotten in, Pat? Uh, paying back. 
dues to the United Nations. Uh, Monica. On global warming, former Microsoft a genius Nathan Mirvald came up with an idea that wouldn't wreck the global economy. If you believe there's excess CO2 in the atmosphere, pump sulfur dioxide. You can do it for the cost of one fighter jet. That's but, innovation. Mort. I think the uh, leaking of the uh, information on global climate has caused a major review of all of these issues and give a, w one way or another will resolve it. A good idea. Uh, best idea of 2009, Iran's protesters used Facebook and Twitter during their protest of Iran's government. These social networking sites permitted the protesters to mobilize and strategize their rallies. We should use them more on this set, Pat, don't you right. think? Yeah. Pat, worst idea of 2009. The Cop Copenhagen Summit on Global Warming. <laughs> Uh, injecting abortion politics into the health care debate, worst idea. Monica. The White House's decision to bring Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and other top al-Qaeda terrorists to New York City to stand trial. Mort. Tiger Woods using text messaging and voicemails for various of his female friends. Uh, Tiger Woods also, I would say, is the worst idea. His decision to keep mum after his 2, 2 a.m. car wreck. That made delay made possible a flood of reports by a string of mistresses. He should have closed that gap. Okay. Uh, sorry to see you go, Pat. McLaughlin panelist Robert Novak. Well said. Senator, Senator Ted Kennedy. Monica. Four towering conservative minds, Bob Novak, Jack Kemp, Irving Kristol, and Bill Sapphire. More. Yes, Walter Cronkite and Bill Sapphire, two of the towering uh, journalistic figures of the post-war period. And uh, fortunately, they didn't live to see the decline of newspapers in America. I'm uh, sorry to see them go. I would uh, echo all of, uh, all of the above. And sorry to see you co Senator Ted Kennedy, the liberal line of the Senate. Both Democrats and Republicans feel his absence. Okay, 15 minutes of fame. Pat. The Salahis. <laughs> the Salahis. Now, they were the okay. gay crash. They were the guests, unwanted guests at the White House. Eleanor. I agree, especially the red sorry. <laughs> Monica. Tiger Woods' numerous extramarital friends. Mort. Tom DeLay dancing for 15 minutes on Dancing with the Stars, wearing a, a, a satin outfit and saying it's connecting him to his feminine side. Right. 15 minutes of fame. It has to go to Tarek and Michaela Salahi, the gay crashes of the White House. By the way, their story is going to be spun out further in the House's Homeland Security Committee. We haven't heard the, the end of them. Best spin of the year, Pat. It's a perennial. I'm resigning because I want to spend more time with my family. <laughs> Oh, no. uh, President Obama in his Nobel speech at Oslo squaring the circle between having just committed more troops to Afghanistan and accepting a peace award and doing it under the rubric of the just war. It was masterful. It was. Monica. On that subject, best spin, that the president needed three months to uh, get to his decision to increase troops by 30,000 in Afghanistan. We got that number weeks before he made the announcement, so that suggests he was stalling until health care got a foothold in the Congress. Uh, best spin, Mort. Yeah, I think uh, I join with Eleanor. I think the uh, uh, Obama speech at the Nobel Prize acceptance thing uh, to deal with uh, the war in Afghanistan. Uh, best spin of the year, President Obama's blaming Bush for his problems. This spin worked, worked for the first nine months, which is a pretty long time, long life in the world of spin. Uh, but now, spent spin. Okay, most honest person of the year. Ron Paul. Audit the Fed. He's moving with his idea after 30 years. Libertarianism <laughs> now. Eleanor. Alan Greenspan testifying on Capitol Hill that he made a mistake in believing that the markets could correct themselves. Monica. Clint Eastwood, who is a longtime conservative in deep left Hollywood, said this, quote, we're, be we're becoming more juvenile as a nation. The guys who won World War II and that whole generation have disappeared, and now we have a bunch of teenage twits. Most honest. Uh, Mort. President Obama, on hearing that he received the Nobel Prize, said, who me? Uh, most honest person of the year, Angelina Jolie. She criticized President Obama for backing away from his campaign promises about human rights abuses in Darfur, which we're going to take up soon on this show. Okay, the most overrated, Pat. Global warming. Hello. <laughs> Charlie Crist, who turns out was mostly an absentee governor. Monica. Tim Geithner, supposed boy genius, just had to be Treasury Secretary, has been a complete disappointment. Mort. Ah, the leaders of most of our major financial institutions in this country. Ah, uh, the most overrated is freedom. When faced with economic uncertainty, people don't want freedom. When they can't see their economic future, they want the nanny state. Okay, the most underrated. Robert Gates, most powerful man in the cabinet.
Oh. Nancy Pelosi, who's held together a very fractious Democratic caucus and is raising money like crazy so she can prove all you people wrong that the Democrats are going to lose the majority. Monica. Sarah Palin. She has a lot more political and cultural power than her critics can see or admit. More, most underrated. Dennis Blair, who is the head of our intelligence service and has done a brilliant job. Most underrated, the intensity of the anger in the U.S. middle class. 78 million American baby boomers will soon wake up to the fact that their net worth is shattered and 15 million Americans will realize that their jobs are not coming back. Okay, macro predictions, Pat. I think we're headed, John, down the road to a confrontation with Iran in the year 2010 with uh, escalated sanctions and maybe leading down the road to military action. Uh, homegrown jihadism is the next phase in the war against extremism and the uh, arrest of the five young men from Virginia in Pakistan, they'd gone over there to, attend, to go to a jihad training camp, uh, suggests how the internet uh, helps people self-radicalize and it's a wonderful recruiting tool for uh, jihad leaders. And the promising side of that story is that their parents immigrants, Muslims, uh, now American citizens, went to the FBI to report that they were missing. And so this is a generational shift in that population. We have to nurture the older attitudes. Uh, the net is also a wonderful way for the Al-Qaeda to communicate with its operatives around the world. Right. Um, Monica. I think that much of the rest of the world, um, from Germany to China, will be looking at a much more robust economic rebound this year, more robust than the United States, because those countries did much more targeted economic stimulus. A lot of them did tax cuts, and they handled the global recession in a much more effective way than we did. What? The populist anger that we have seen this past year that has been directed against the financial world in part by the Obama administration is going to continue to grow and produce a lot of legislation that in the long run is going to really inhibit the American economy. Macro prediction. In, in 2008, I predicted an economic downturn. In 2009, I predicted the recession would morph into a major economic meltdown mm -hmm. with unemployment reaching 11%. In 2010, this coming year, there will be populist protests, turnover at the polls, uprising worldwide against entrenched political and business elites. It will be a deep popular discontent. It will be fed by the recession and will be the defining political force of the coming decade. Political, in political incumbents had better beware. It will be a mood of extreme anti-incumbency. Yeah. Do you agree? Yes, I certainly do agree. I think, it, as Pat was implying before, the elites of this country have no awareness, really, almost how strong that is. And the danger is, if you get a political leadership that really tries to stoke it up and channel it, mm -hmm. you can, as I say, create a lot of havoc in our country. That's the part I worry about. But that it's going to be there is absolutely going to be the case. We have now a tapestry that is formulated on uh, Barack Obama's presence presidency for uh, almost a complete year one. How is he being defined up against his immediate predecessor, George W. Bush, and or Bill Clinton, and or Bush Sr., and or Ronald Reagan? Do we have any kind of an impression of uh, him no. against any of those tableaus? Well, Hold on, Eleanor. Pat? Uh, <clears throat> no, John, I don't, I, I don't. I think we've entered a brand new era. And I think Reagan's era was, he was great. He was a wonderful president for that uh, time. Obama has failed in the sense that he wanted to be a unifier, and he has failed to be that. His, he's gotten down to his base, and the country may be so divided ideologically, racially, ethnically, politically, religiously, because of the culture wars of the 60 and all the rest of it, that it cannot really be united behind any you single party. You mean he didn't put agenda. economy first? I know. I think he tried personally, but the country is divided over what it wants to do. One part of it doesn't want health care, doesn't want stimulus. He wants the private sector built up. The other party is the party of government. Did he try to cover too many uh, big yeah. issues at once? Yes. Well, he, no. for yes. sure. well, first of all, he for won sure. with 53 percent of the vote. So, you know, the country is not uh, all together even when they elect a president. Secondly, the presidents who did the worst in their first year, the ones that, tend to, that went on to get elected, Reagan, Clinton, the ones who did the best, Carter, Bush Sr., were the ones who lost re-election. So I don't think you can tell anything now. But you do have an administration of Congress struggling 
to, to get a hold of this populist anger and respond to it. And what we're discovering is our system, and it's the way the Founding Fathers designed it, it's very hard to get that, uh, to build those coalitions. When you have one senator who can basically shut down legislation, it's really difficult to move now, forward with the kind of speed that the, yeah. that the crisis situation demands. Uh, do you want to give us some economic good news? For example, foreclosures are, uh, have dropped. Uh, and uh, isn't there, is there any good news with regard to consumer spending? I believe there is a, a current uh, upburst in connection with Christmas? I think there is uh, a bit of uh, improvement. We've not only stopped going down, I think we've begun to go up a little bit. I just don't know how sustainable it is, and if we don't get that under control, that's going to dominate everything. Absolutely. I totally agree with him, and that's why I think, yes, he did get 53 percent of the vote, but Obama is now down at about 44, 45 percent, and it is for that exact reason. It is the economy, stupid. And for better or for worse, Obama is perceived as stepping back from the economy for the first year focusing on health care, focusing on cap and trade, off in the weeds on those issues, and not focused on the bread and butter issues facing Americans, and in particular, jobs. Okay, New Year's resolutions, 10 seconds each. Pat. Uh, begin the writing the memoir of my years with Richard Milhouse Nixon. Hello. Um, I resolved to stay cool and calm, and calm in the Obama no drama tradition as the global warming debate heats up, confident that I have science and the facts on my side. What? Uh, Monica, excuse uh, me. I can't wait to read uh, Pat's memoir about the Nixon years. I'll be the first one in line buying that uh, book. I resolved to try to do a World War II tour of Europe. This right. Year. Mort. Proving that modern tabloid newspapers can still survive and flourish in American cities. Uh, my resolution is to keep the McLaughlin Group the most insightful, analytical, and accurate political program on the air and online. Happy New Year. Bye-bye. If, for such a small word, it packs a wallop. If I live to a hundred, if social security isn't enough, if my heart gets broken, if she says yes. We believe if should never hold you back. If should be managed with a plan that builds on what you already have. Together, we can create a personal safety net, a launching pad for all those brilliant ifs in the middle of life. You can call on our expertise and get guarantees for the if in life. After all, we're MetLife.